The year was 1981. And before communication throughout the world was as easy as it is today, all the eyes of the world were fixed in a small town, small village in Italy, village of Frascati. You see, what happened that day was a six-year-old boy playing fell in a water well, and he could not get out. And the town gathered whatever rescue equipment they had, and they contacted the nearby city, and they began an effort to get the little boy out. The idea was to drill, dig a shaft parallel to where he was, and be able to cut across and bring the child out. What they did not count on were all the years that water seepage went into the earth, so when they dug the well, it collapsed, taking the child further down. They got the smallest person in the town, they put a harness on him and sent him down and he could not reach the child. Now what do you do? The night was setting, the light was going out, they set up some flood lighting, and to make sure that they had not lost the child, they sent down a microphone. And they yelled for the child to say something, and this is what the child said, Mama, Mama, when are you coming? Today the cry of Isaiah is very much like that. <clears throat> Different words, oh that you would rent the heavens that you would come down. Now what's going on? You have to remember that the Hebrew nation had been conquered and now they're held captive. They are in the midst of what's called the diaspora. They were spread all over. They had no place to worship. And Isaiah yearns for a sign from God. He felt forsaken by God. He felt very alone. Remember, he had been given the responsibility to speak for God to his people. And he could not do that. Because God was not talking to him. And I'm sure that each one of us has come across a little bit of time like that when God is totally absent. When you are somewhere where you think you're not supposed to be and you have to survive. I remember moving to the city of Miami, November the 12th, 1960, as a young boy, unable to speak the language to even eat not knowing what the signs meant, except for the stop sign, because that is universal, the argument. I knew not to go until I was told to continue. You're lost. All the, the practices, all the prayers, all the things that I did in the Roman church, I would go through the litany of all that, and God was not answering me at all. That's the same way that Isaiah feels right now. He feels forsaken for several reasons. The first one I want to share with you is the hardships these people were enduring. Times were very hard. People were oppressed. And things were getting from bad to worse. And sometimes life snags us. And we get a bill for the experience. These are the times when we find ourselves in darkness. We struggle with things like illness, grief, fear, despair, and loneliness. And we ask, where is God in all this? The perennial question for us in modern times was and is and probably will be for a while longer. Where was God on 9-11? I believe that these are the times when the Master Gardener is shaping us to be that which he created us to be, and that is to be beautiful flowers. However, in that pruning and trimming and moving, he sometimes doesn't speak. He sometimes lets his silence reign. Isaiah was also 
frustrated and felt forsaken because of the oppressive power of sin that his people were experiencing. Sometimes when you move away from what is comfortable for you, what is known to you, some things that even when you don't know about them guide you to where you need to be. Sometimes when you're away from those, sin lurks in the shadows. And I do not want to be over dramatic. But Isaiah sees the unhappiness, the tragedies, and the waywardness of his people, and he laments. He laments and he goes as far as to blame God for it. If you had not hidden your face from us, we wouldn't be in this predicament. If you had not moved away from us, we wouldn't be in this predicament. He accuses God of leading people into sin and hardening their hearts against repentance. That's not the God I know, and I hope it's not the God that you know. Many jokes have been made about sin because it is a difficult thing to talk about. But the forbidden is always very alluring to us. We get in trouble and sin because we avoid the warning signs of a situation. A situation where danger lurks, where danger is imminent. Temptation can swallow us whole and can swallow a whole nation. And Isaiah saw this and cried, Mama, Mama, when are you coming? His frustration was also about the silence of God in the midst of his people's predicament and desperate situation. Have you ever experienced God's thundering silence? When you ask for something and there is no yes, there is no no, and there is not yet, there is nothing, not even other sounds, there is nothing. Have you waited for God's answer and it does not come? Some things are set right very quickly and others take a long time. Venture to guess how many years Abraham and Sarah had to wait to have a child. If you remember the story in Genesis, Sarah is in the house and Abraham is doing whatever it was Abraham did at that time of day. And three figures come up. And in the span of the conversation when Sarah is preparing pancakes to be hospitable and receive these three figures, they say to Abraham that you will have a child. And Elizabeth being considered barren, the Bible says she laughed. Now later on, we consider those three figures the first time that the Trinity appears. So imagine laughing at God when he says, well, you're going to have a kiddo. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. That's what happened. How long? 25 years. 25 years of waiting. And sometimes we write because we have to wait a little time. Let me illustrate this. There's a story, and this is one of the stories that are now joined by many, many other stories. And we see them on television quite frequently. But this happens in 1970. Mr. Malcolm Emery, a student who had just received a scholarship to Northwestern University for physics. And once he finished that, he had a research job waiting for the Navy, or at the, in the Navy. And he is in a library doing research, and he walks out and into a demonstration against the war in Vietnam. He is quickly pushed away by a policeman and arrested for throwing a rock. 
He claims that he could have not done that because his arms were full of books, and there was no way that he could do that. But only the testimony of that one policeman held water, and he was arrested. Never really convicted, never served time. But the arrest took him out of Northwestern University and out of the Navy. For five years, he tried to right that situation. And finally, a picture that was taken at that time. Finally, 20 years later. 20 years later. It shows him to have been very accurate in his account. The door is swinging closed to the library, and he's carrying books on both hands. There's no way that he could have thrown them off. One of many stories. Now we hear people who have served sentence of 38 years, 42 years, 28, 25, and now DNA is saying you didn't do it. Imagine waiting that period of time and wondering where God is. Sometimes all we can do is wait. Sometimes all we can do is pray, Mama, Mama, when are you coming? Now, I don't want to be a doomsayer, because there are good news in the midst of all this. Christmas says that God does come. Christmas says that God is on his way. Our blue serum white color tells us that we are waiting this is the advent, adviente, advente, before he comes, time for the church to wait for God's birth. And I say anew that God is faithful to his promises and faithful to his people, and that someday a Redeemer would come. Again, another illustration, because sometimes we get lost and we say, well, that was back in the Bible, that's back in the desert, that's back, back, but no, 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 let's move it forward. A couple gets married, she's 18, he's 19. They're married for six years, they have three children, beautiful kids. The dad is employed and she has the opportunity to be a housewife. And one day something snaps, because she is in the kitchen, in front of a sink full of dirty dishes and two loads of undone laundry. And she says, I've had enough, I'm out of here. And she packs a bag and she leaves. Does not leave a forwarding address. You can imagine what the husband and the father is going through, he's trying to find her. Every so often she would call to check on the kids. And every time he would say to her, come home, I love you. He is so distraught that he hires a private detective who, after a period of months, locates her in a rundown motel in Des Moines, Iowa. And he packs up and goes, Trembling because he does not know how she's going to receive him, he knocks on the door and she opens the door and begins crying. And he says, why, why didn't you come home? Don't you know that I love you? I said that to you every time we talked on the phone. He said, yes, you did that. But your love were words. Now you came. Sometimes we feel God is absent. Sometimes we are afraid because we're alone. Sometimes we think we're forsaken, that God is silent, that the wait is too long. But we cannot give up. We cannot give up because he is right next to us, walking with us. He will come, and we will see his salvation. Isaiah says, oh, that you would rent the heavens, that you would come down. Well, he did come down, and he will come down again, and that's what we're preparing for. 
So make each Christmas light, each Christmas ornament, each Christmas song that you hear a reminder that God keeps his promises and he will come. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.